Karma and I would like to welcome you to episode four of The Pursuit of a Ten. You went down? Okay. I know what you're thinking. Ethan, why are you inside if you're filming an episode of The Pursuit of a Ten? Shouldn't you be out on a lake trying to catch a fish? Well, to be honest with you, it is raining outside and I have no opportunity to fish today, so I actually have something even better for you. I actually just got off of a Skype call with a couple of fisheries biologists and we were talking all things bluegill. Man, I tell you what, I personally learned a ton from these guys, so I cannot thank them enough, but I wanted to share all of this information with you as well because quite frankly, part of becoming a better big bluegill angler is learning. It's not always about going out on the water and actually trying to catch fish. It's also about the research and about the education, and that's what I wanted to bring to you with this series. Now, you're gonna have to bear with me a little bit. It was a Skype call, and we don't have like the nicest webcams in the world, so the, the quality of the video is going to be a little bit lower than you're probably used to. I am going to overlay some videos and photos though throughout this to kind of act as visual examples. Um, the other thing that you can actually do with this video is you can literally turn it on and just listen to it almost like a podcast because most of the value from today's video is going to be through the ears, not necessarily the eyes. But in the next episode of The Pursuit of a Ten, we're going to get back to fishing. That being said, I thought this would be such a valuable learning opportunity for all of us. So without further ado, let's hop right into it. Ben, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, um, about what you work on, and then in addition, at the end, I want you to tell me what your favorite fish is, whether that's to catch or um, to you know, kind of work with. So my name is Ben Neelick. I'm a fisheries research biologist with Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks. I've been with this agency for about 10 years. Uh, previously, I worked as a fisheries manager in Texas and I worked on a river research project at the University of Nebraska. I have a, a bachelor's degree from Kansas State University, a master's degree from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Uh, I've been kind of dialed in on, on sport fish management lately. Um, it, it seems like I'm, I'm focused on blue fish. So I like to work with bluegill. I like to work with blue catfish. Those are my two favorites. Uh, I did my thesis work on blue suckers in the Missouri River. Now, right now, we're really focused in on trying to understand the role that bluegill, blue catfish, um, those two in particular right now are playing in our in our systems uh, and trying to figure out the best way that we can to manage these these species. And we're trying to do that for everything. Those are just the two that I'm dialed in on at the moment. Favorite species is is bluegill. Always has been. They they have the the, the most unique life history. Um, and there's just so much that we can learn about them. We've already learned a ton about bluegill as a scientific community. But there's there's a whole lot more that we can learn, uh, and I'm hopeful we get to talk about some of that towards towards the end of this. And Connor, uh, how about you do the same? My name is Connor Osowski. I'm a fisheries management biologist for the Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks in Southeast Kansas. I went to the University of Nebraska in Lincoln and got my bachelor's uh, after that, and fisheries and wildlife got my bachelor's, uh, and then. After graduating with my bachelor's, I spent some time up on the Red River of the North in Manitoba, uh, working on the trophy channel catfish population up there. After that, that brought me down to Emporia, where I worked with Ben out of our uh, research office, did a lot of bluegill age and growth research out of that office for a couple of years, and then got down here in Southeast Kansas and Pittsburgh and trying to manage for big bluegill and big bass down here in Southeast Kansas. So I'm especially interested in the system and lakes that I manage to understand what makes big bluegill and interested in improving that. But my favorite fish species has to be a channel catfish. Um, I grew up fishing for them. However, I'm starting to learn more and more that bluegill are right up there, bluegill and warmouth and, and red ear sunfish, the panfish trifecta. It's It's been a blast to learn how to fish for them and transition from viewing them as bait to actually targeting them. It's, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah. And that's like another thing that I think I might've actually learned from Ben's talk. And it's been so long since I listened to that podcast, but uh, a lot of people view blue, bluegill as bait. I'm such an artificial guy. I'd never use bait in general. And I kind of forget that some people literally just they catch them specifically for bait and i that's those all those big catfish hunters so that's a that's a good thing that you just brought that up i sent you guys the questions and i'm sure i'll come up with random questions along the way as well but i 
I really try to keep it pretty high level and just talk about some really basics um, because we are not scientists. You are scientists. You are probably going to use a lot of words that I don't understand, but I'm trying to dumb things down a little bit, make it a little bit more um, just basic for us anglers and how we maybe um, will understand these fish. So the first one would really be what are like the general seasonal patterns of bluegill? Knowing that by body of water and location, it can differ a little bit. What would you say like fall, um, winter, spring, summer, how do they act and how does that change throughout the year? So I will say that I have noticed kind of a trend down here in southeast Kansas. It seems like bluegill are a shoreline oriented species. So all throughout the year, they're going to be along the shoreline, which what we call the littoral zone, uh, usually shallow water next to shore. But what I have found is that in the springtime, those larger bluegill like to hang out on the breaks and water depth. So anywhere where you have shallow water meeting deeper water, uh, you have a lot of those bigger bluegill that tend to hang out in those drop-offs and weed edges that might be a little deeper than just two feet of water. It seems like those bigger bluegill do tend to congregate a little deeper along those drop-offs. Anywhere from eight to 12 feet is what I've noticed. Early summer, uh, that's when the spawn usually triggers anywhere from 65 to 80 degree water temperature. They'll, they'll move up during the spawn. Uh, you'll be able to find them up shallow, all sizes. In the fall, it tends to be that those different sizes of fish, they tend to mix together. You find the big fish with the small fish and in the winter time, it seems like those bigger fish kind of follow that early spring pattern where you the find them drops. a lot further out deeper and not so much mixed with the bigger or with the smaller fish. So they tend to school up by size group. I've heard that a lot about a lot of species, so I guess that makes a lot of sense. And quite frankly, as I've gone through this deal, there's a couple times where it's just like random. All of a sudden, I catch a big one mixed in with a bunch of dinks. But it certainly feels like when I saw spawning pods and stuff like that, there would be... A group of big fish and then i'd see another group and it would just be like a million tiny fish so that makes a lot of sense um so during the fall are they kind of like bass are they like really feeding heavily heavily or is that more of a bass thing it seems like it they they like to feed a lot more heavily and in, in the fall putting on their energy for for the colder water temperatures but in all honesty bluegill are pretty opportunistic feeders they're okay. going to be feeding all year round and that really actually leads very well into my next question what is like the typical forage of bluegill? Understanding this is also going to vary. You can be pretty broad here um, because certainly there's different forage species in Kansas than there are in Michigan than there is in California, so on and so forth. Um, is it tends to be insect larva or what, what do they eat? And does it vary by size? Insects, uh, plankton, zooplankton are a pretty important food species for, for bluegill. Crustaceans, crayfish. I like to think of them as the trout of the Midwest. You kind of have to match the hatch to, to really target those bigger bluegills. And that's kind of what's really fueled my fire outside of my being a biologist. I love to get out and fish and it's definitely a challenge to, to use and match the hatch. Like if you have a, a midge hatch, which are blood worms that emerge from the, the bottom of the lake. If you can match when those midges are hatching in the early summer months, right after the spawn, it's those bigger bluegill really tend to... Really? to feed on blood worms especially but stone flies mayflies mayfly larva it's they're they're opportunistic but insects i would say are up there for being the most important interesting okay so what we learned so far is basically bluegill are opportunistic feeders they feed heavily on insects and obviously the best way to key in on that would be looking at your local area learning a little bit about what's hatching and when and then also kind of um I guess factoring in the kind of the type of water you're fishing because I suppose that can vary significantly by like river versus clear lake versus muddy silty lake. Uh, I've got a lot to learn. And then it sounds like they have some seasonal patterns, spring and winter, steep banks, they work off a little deeper. As it approaches early summer, they spawn. And then you said in the fall, they tend to feed and group up more, even as by size, they even group up with smaller fish too. I'm learning here and I had to repeat it so I make sure I say it out loud and then I'll really remember it. I am going to get to the the next question being around the spawn and that's actually kind of relevant. The spawn's pretty much closing up here. I'm still finding a few on beds but I think I think it's like such a interesting topic. So walk me through the spawn and maybe some of these interesting facts that you've shared before about spawning bluegill and kind of how they um, how they allocate their energy 
that they took in from that food we just talked about. I got this one, Connor. Yes. Yeah, you take you it. You can take a break. So, so the spawning ecology of bluegill is, is really neat. Bluegill have this unique life history trait, males in particular, where some will just never get big. They'll be mimicry females. Uh, they'll be male fish. Uh, they'll be reproductively mature, but they'll only be three inches long. And the reason they do that is because they can sneak into uh, beds. So bluegill prepare bed, male bluegill prepare beds, um, the big bulls that you want to catch they fan out those circles you know if, if you've seen them you you know what you're seeing it looks like cow footprints going through the lake uh, and they're super symmetrical and uh, they're always just cleared off and the, and the bluegill will fan those and keep them nice and clean and they build them in colonies if, if it's a suitable substrate and it's a big area uh, it'll be covered in those beds and typically the bigger fish will get the middle because the middle is the protected area. The biggest, baddest bluegill, male bluegill, get those middle spots. And then around the periphery, it, it seems to be the ones that are um, a little bit smaller, a little bit weaker. So those sneaker males can get in there and pretend like they're females and fertilize eggs when the big males aren't looking. <laughs> big males don't care about them because they think they're females. So that's one life history trait. And those fish just never get big. When you're looking at the, the parental life history trait, those males don't reach maturity until they're two or three or four years old because all of the energy that they're taking in, they're converting to getting bigger. So they're wanting to be the, the biggest, baddest dude in there. So they don't reach maturity until they're older. But by that point, they're already eight or nine inches long. Hmm. Uh, and then they're able to get in and spawn and get those better spawning positions, which leads to better females, uh, which leads to you know, more offspring. And, and ecologically, it's every critter's goal to create offspring. Um, I mean, that's that's just ecological theory. The arrangement of how they spawn is what's so neat just in those beds and even the dynamics within those beds, you know, who gets the best spots is a, is a pretty fascinating, pretty fascinating thing. So those little males that are actually sexually mature and they're only like three inches long, but they almost look like a female did they reach mature sexual maturity earlier in their life so what how long does it take them to reach it i'm not sure if you said that uh, a year so they'll hatch in now and then they'll be spawning next year it, it might be a little bit longer up north it might be a, a two-year thing or maybe even more than that but here it's it's one year and, and south of here it's one year Wow. So that's interesting. So I guess one thing to take away from that as an angler, though, is when they are on beds, you know, if, if you're looking for as big a fish as you can find, one, we already learned that bigger fish tend to group up. And two, the center of that spawning, you know, area, if you will, is probably where you're going to see the biggest and the baddest males. On that topic, I've, I've talked about this a little bit in my videos, and I guess, you know, with regards to spawn, knowing that these fish are just so abundant in a lot of bodies of water across the nation, and just their population density is big, and, and then across states, it seems like panfish um, limits are quite high, generally speaking. Um, bluegill, I think here is 25. I'm not sure what it is in Kansas. What is the responsible way to go about keeping fish while they're spawning because i know it's like with bass for example like every bass angler cringes at the thought of keeping a bass but during the spawn it's like that's like a death threat i mean that's not okay with bluegill is it okay what's the dynamic there that all depends on the on the angler's objective and the sure. objective of the fishery if the objective of the fishery is to create big fish and to have great angling opportunities it's not good to keep fish during the spawn at all at all uh, that's, that's Females, males, small, large. It doesn't do you any good. Okay. Uh, those males are the ones, and you can get the females too, of course, but those big males are the ones that you're going to catch. And the reason you're going to catch those is because they're defending their nest. Sure. So it doesn't matter what you drag through there. I mean, you know, if it's a if it's a crawler on a hook or a jig or whatever, they're going to attack it. And it's not because they're hungry. It's because they, they're protecting their nest. Sure. So those fish, if you, if you remember back to the life history traits where some of the males never get big, but the other put off the sexual maturity so they can get big, you're selectively picking off these ones that are getting big hmm. when you're bluegill angling on beds. You got it. So the, the fish on the beds that are protecting the beds are the biggest ones, the baddest ones in the population. And when you pull those out of there, you're opening up space for those smaller fish to get in and reproduce without uh, any competition. Yeah. Huh. So, so strictly from a huh. creating big fish perspective, harvest of bed fish, bluegill, it doesn't do you any favors. However, bluegill do provide food and fish are a renewable resource. Sure. And a large portion of, of anglers fish for for food and trophies. Um, you know, so balancing that from a manager perspective is difficult. 
uh, in Kansas, like like we've talked about, we, we don't have a, a limit on bluegill. It's really? a, it's a free for all. Wow. And and we get anglers that, that keep a lot of them uh, at times, and that's you know that's okay. The the issue is when that happens during the spawn. Okay. Because then it's just very selective harvest of those big fish that you're trying to protect. Yeah. And unfortunately, just because it is an industry and, you know, it's a supply and demand thing, just like anything else, you can't necessarily always just do what's right for the fishery and the policies you create. You have to do what's right for a macro environment of people spending money in fishing gear and licenses and that sort of thing. So if all, t- all of a sudden tomorrow, if you said you try to create a policy where it's like, you guys can't keep fish in the month of June or whatever. There would be an uproar that people would not be okay with that, unfortunately. But the people that understand that might be. So, you know, that's part of the reason I I do this stuff is because I want, I'm not saying it's wrong to keep fish and I don't want that to be a thing. Uh, But it's just like, I think we all as anglers have a responsibility to understand the impact of taking a fish because at the end of the day, there's limited water, limited, it is a resource. And um, so I thought that was really interesting. I didn't expect you to tell me that, quite frankly. I knew that I was going to get some information around it not being necessarily good to keep big males but what i didn't really expect to get was that's not really a good idea to keep anything and so that's that's wild what about throughout the rest of the year you know it sounds like it's not the end of the world if people keep fish because how abundant they are and whatnot but throughout the rest of the year um is there a specific for big bluegill trophy creation for a body of water what would be like the smartest play does it matter male versus female is there a specific size range, like a mid to like large size, but not necessarily big, big? What what would that look like? If I had my way, okay. I mean, this is pie in the sky kind of thing. Sure. Uh, every male bluegill over, it would depend on the leg, eight inches. Sure. Would be thrown back. Okay. And, and the reason that I hit on the spawn in particular, just because the, you know, like I said, it, and I'm not against fish harvest either. I, I, no, no. Like I said, the renewable resource, uh, it, it's great. And if the objectives are fish harvest, I mean, by all means. Uh, but during the spawn, those males, one, are, are they're the they're the best. They're, if, if you're managing for trophies, those males that are guarding the nests are the trophies. They're the ones that are growing the fastest and the ones that are the biggest. And two, they're just so darn easy to catch <laughs> during the spawn. If you have a pair of polarized sunglasses and a stick and a string, you can catch them if you can yeah, see those beds. Yeah, for sure. During the rest of the year, of course, if you catch them, you're going to be catching some of those fish and harvesting them. Uh, the difference is during the rest of the year is you're not actively targeting the, the most aggressive, the fastest growing fish in the population. It takes more skill and you're probably going to get a very small percentage of them. Whereas you could wipe them clean yes. while they're spawning. Got it. That's interesting. Exactly. Man. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And, uh, I think this is, I mean, that's exactly what I was hoping to, to learn about. And that's, that's cool. I actually, I probably will keep some bluegill here one of these days, but I, I definitely like the idea of trying to do it maybe in the winter while I'm ice fishing or whatever. Not that I'm good at ice fishing. I tend to catch the small ones. But you know, if I catch a few big ones, I'm not going to feel too bad about it is what it sounds like. Anything I missed? Is there anything that you guys had uh, besides that on spawn or any of the other dynamics around keeping fish? I will say uh, from an angler standpoint, we as an agency put out our sampling data. And in that sampling data, you'll be able to see our sampling data from with largemouth bass in the spring. Uh, depending on the state that you're in. But here in Kansas, we sample for bass in the spring. And if you look at those higher densities of bass, especially those slot length fish from those largemouth bass from 12 to 15 inches, if there's a high density of those, I will say that that's a good indicator that there's a good chance that there's going to be some 8 inch plus bluegill, Hmm. just from my, my perspective. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Actually, that makes me think of something. So I've always felt like whenever I find a lake that has more sizable bass, I notice more sizable bluegill. Are you saying that you've also noticed that somewhat of a relate? There's a relationship there almost. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So okay, I wasn't mistaken. Every lake can support X pounds of bluegill. For example, it can support 10 pounds of bluegill. So it can either have one 10 pound bluegill <laughs> or 10 one pound bluegill. Huh. Or anything in between. So when you get a lot of those bass that are eating on the bluegill, you're thinning out those small ones and those resources, uh, because, as, as Connor alluded to earlier, the, I mean, because they're such generalists in diets, and the little ones are pretty much eating the same thing as the big ones. If you can thin those smaller ones out, then you're opening up space for the big ones. Sure. Uh, alternatively, if you take one of the big ones out, if you take one of the ten pounders out, it can yeah. be replaced with ten one pounders, and uh, huh. 
have the opposite effect. So that's why the, the high numbers of bass are, are good for bigger bluegill because they, they clear out some of those small ones and open up the food web basically for those bigger fish. As I continue to find, you know, learn more about all this stuff and, and find it more and more fascinating the more I learn, it'd be fun to just like go catch a pike, catch a couple bass and just look inside their stomach. Just see what the heck they ate. Because I bet you, I bet you some of these two pound bass probably are just, there's probably a bunch of little three inch bluegill in there. You, you should do it. Fish, yeah, fish harvest is okay. Uh, it is. The, the state agencies set the regulations based on what the fishery can sustain. And if they tell you you can keep five bass over 15 inches, I mean, that's perfectly fine. Well, up do. here, I think we could use it in half of our lakes. How's your vegetation? Is there a high density of vegetation up there? Tons. Yeah. That's the other thing that you got to think about, too, is that when you have a, a large amount of vegetation in a lake, it tends to be a hideout for those smaller bluegills to where they can't thin, be thinned out by the largemouth bass. They can't feed as efficiently <laughs> on those bluegill. That can cause smaller bluegill as well, just from a really? pure density standpoint. So that's another thing that, to keep in mind. That makes a lot of sense because <laughs> there's too many hidey holes. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's a scientific term, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> what other environments would create big bluegill in your experience? Lots of nutrients are good, so um, too many nutrients are bad. But we we have a lot of we drain a lot of farmland in Kansas, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus in the soil and in the chemicals and everything. When those come in, those jumpstart the food webs. So Interesting. Okay. We have very fast growing conditions because there's the nitrogen and phosphorus comes in and creates food for. Uh, uh, phytoplankton, which creates food for zooplankton, which creates food for uh, bugs, which creates food for little fish to big fish. Anyway, so you have to have suitable amounts of, of nutrients, and that's not something that we struggle with here. As you move north, uh, probably further north in Michigan, um, you start to run into lower fertility, uh, and it can, it can provide an issue. There should be some vegetation. So it, it's the, the Goldilocks and the porridge thing. So you can't have too much, and you can't have too little, but you have just the right amount of vegetation because if there isn't any veg then those fish are, are going to be eaten uh, before they have an opportunity to to spawn and get big so we only want some of them to get eaten before they get there and then the ones that survive to be able to pass through uh, i'll just kind of tie with that good water quality so in the same breath is it's good to have nutrients but not an abundance of nutrients so is that how an algae water. bloom happens yeah okay so somewhat clearer or cleaner water but an abundance of nutrients just don't cross this line that creates an algae bloom and makes it too gross yeah there's there, it's a balance one more question here and then i'll open up the floor for any other comments that you guys had that i just completely missed on what can we as anglers do to help keep our fisheries or bluegill populations healthy just be mindful of the uh, potential impact of your harvest to those larger bluegills uh, it's okay to to harvest a few of those bigger bluegill over eight inches, just be mindful of the, the impact, long-term impact. It's It may have an impact five years down the road, and we don't necessarily as anglers think long-term. Uh, so just be mindful of that, of the harvest impact. I want to I want to plug for fish handling. Delayed mortality where you, you catch a fish and turn it loose and watch it swim away, um, just being cognizant of how long it's out of the water and you know, that kind of thing can be, it can make a big difference. You broke up a little bit on my side, so I don't know if it'll come through or not, but essentially I'll just repeat it back. Uh, he talked about proper fish handling and fish care and, you know, hauling around bass or any other species in the live well all day just to get pictures is maybe not the most responsible thing in the world. People don't tend to think about the delayed mortality, so I, I just wanted to throw that out. That's a good, I mean, hey, I appreciate you throwing that out there because I think it's I think it's something to be cognizant of too, and especially when you're not even fishing a tournament. You're just literally getting pictures for your uh, social media. It's a little silly. Is there anything else about bluegill or about fishing in general that you wanted to share while we have you? There's no greater joy in life than using the cane pole and dragging something across a bluegill's bed and making it mad enough to, to bite that and bring it in. That will, that will take you back to six years old every single time. Even the guys that, that fish for a living, even the guys that have $120,000 boats, I, I strongly encourage your users, listeners, to go out in the summer. We're probably a little bit late right now, but to go through with a cane pole that you can get at Walmart for 12 bucks and just drag a little jig through there. 
All right. Make, I'm going to go buy a kid. cane pole as soon as this is over. <laughs> I've got way too high high tech of equipment. I really need to go back to the basics is what I'm told. Connor, anything else? Oh, I don't believe so. Um, take someone new that has that I guess hasn't been fishing in a while. Uh, if your grandpa or dad hasn't been out fishing for a while, take them out fishing and uh, get anybody outside and just enjoy fishing. We talk about being mindful of, of harvest, but the most important thing is just to get out and go fishing. It's it's one thing to be cognizant of harvesting big bluegill, but at the end of the day, it's it's the it's the joy of fishing that w- why we all do it. So, and another thing that I do want to remind everybody is that we as biologists we we got into this profession because we are anglers first and we love to fish and we care about the resource just as much as as anglers do and some anglers get upset with why we stock certain species and but at at the end of the day we care about the resource uh just as much as anglers do that that utilize these lakes and and me i i get out of the office i go back to the office i I love to, to go fishing after I get off and enjoy the, the waters that I manage. And I know that's the same case for, for other biologists across the United States. So I just want anglers to be reminded of that, that we're, we're anglers ourselves and we love to fish and we care, care just but as much about the lakes. So I'd argue you probably care more because you dedicate your, your life to this um, where we just do it on the weekends or whatever. So no, I, I appreciate that. And guys, I really do appreciate your time. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording now. Uh, wait, before I do, people can find you both on Twitter, I believe, right? Is that cool if I link that in the description? You bet. Yep. Great. Yep, I'm going to link their Twitter's Twitter uh, accounts in the description because they're great follows. Honestly, my entire Twitter is basically dedicated to fisheries biologists. That's pretty much all I follow. I will put out the full disclosure that if you follow Connor, you will be flooded with Nebraska football, baseball, all that stuff content, and it is very annoying, but I still recommend following him. <laughs> okay, so I hope you enjoyed today's video. Despite the fact that it was a little bit different, I was thrilled to have the opportunity to talk to these biologists. They are so full of uh, knowledge, and it was really, really cool to learn a lot of these facts. One of the things that I thought was most interesting is the fact that an abundance of vegetation actually creates an environment where a lot of smaller bluegill thrive. That makes a lot of sense to me, but I never would have thought of that before. So I'm super glad to have had the opportunity so thanks again to connor and ben for joining i really 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 appreciate you guys lastly like i said in the beginning of today's video we are going to get back to fishing in the next episode so stay tuned i feel like i'm well equipped with knowledge i'm well equipped with experience we are on the verge of catching a 10 inch gill i can feel it all right have a great rest of your day we'll catch you next time